This is the pre-lab video for rates of chemical reactions, a clock reaction. So what exactly is a clock reaction? Well, the reaction we're going to be doing is this brom bromate plus iodine on the presence of acid gives you iodine solution and water and bromine. Now the <coughs> bromide. And what we're going to do is determine the rate law. Now there's nothing there that we can easily measure, okay? But it turns out that we can time this reaction by the ability of another reaction to take place. So we're going to add a starch solution to the uh, reaction. And if iodine reacts with starch, it turns it blue. So this is a pretty standard test for starch. Uh, it's also a pretty good test for iodine. And so you'll get this nice strong blue color. And so we're going to time it to see how long it takes. And we're going to vary different things and see how if it changes the time. Now the problem is, is that this reaction is a little too fast for us to time it accurately. So we need to have some way to slow it down. So the solution, if this reaction is fast, is to use the reaction that's faster to kind of slow it down. So we're going to add thiosulfate, potassium thiosulfate, so that's this S2O3. And what it does is it reacts with iodine faster than iodine reacts with starch. So it's basically going to capture the iodine before it reacts with the starch. And then what will happen, eventually, that'll run out. Okay. And so when that runs out, then the iodine that's left over immediately reacts with the starch to give the blue complex. So what we're doing is we're basically slowing the reaction down a little bit because we're giving it a distraction first, which is the thiosulfate. And that allows us a very nice way then to measure the reaction. So this reaction has now got a timer, and so we can call it a clock reaction. So we're going to use this clock reaction then to as an initial rate. So that'll allow us to determine the rate law. So we're going to vary the three species, the bromate, the iodide ion, and the acid concentrations by changing the volumes. And then we'll measure how long it takes to get it to the blue color. And then that can give us a relative rate, which then we can then determine the order. If we double the concentration of something and it halves the amount of time that it takes, then it's uh, first order. If it doesn't affect it at all, it's zero order, okay? So this is pretty straightforward. Now the other thing we're gonna do is we're gonna try it at different temperatures. Okay, now this allows us, we know that rate goes up with temperature, okay? But the rate, the, the degree at which it increases is dependent on the activation energy of the reaction. So we're gonna use the Arrhenius equation which relates rate and temperature. Okay, and so we're going to end up plotting, we're going to figure out the times it takes to turn blue at different temperatures. We can translate that into a relative rate and then plot the natural uh, log of that versus 1 over t. The t has to be in Kelvin, okay? And then the slope in, and this is described in the lab manual, then is the, is the activation energy divided by the gas, the, the, the gas constant, but this is the joules one, 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. That allows us to get the activation energy. It'll probably be in kilojoules per mole. And so then, um, so that allows us to do that. And then finally, we're going to use a catalyst. So we're going to use a molybdenum catalyst to see what a catalyst does. Catalysts lower the activation energy of a reaction. So we would anticipate that the catalyst will accelerate the reaction. But we'll see what the accelerated rate actually is by doing the same reaction plus or minus the catalyst. So this lab will cover basic chemistry glassware again, and it's another perform and interpret reactions with a quantitative component. Pretty much doing it as is from the lab manual, it's, it's pretty much an identical thing, so there's not a lot of changes that we have to worry about. Safety-wise, there's no particular hazards. There's a little bit of HCL that could potentially be corrosive, so you might want to be careful there. By far, so you're going to work in pairs, and by far the biggest problem here is is if you screw this up by getting your glassware dirty. So, you know, you're going to have one set of flasks for flask one and one for flask, and a set of flasks for flask two. You do not want to mix those, okay? You do not want to prematurely start the clock reaction. So, you know, so make sure that you keep your glassware straight. It'd be perfect if you could have, between the pair of you, you could have multiple uh, uh, graduated cylinders and multiple beakers that allow you to sort of do this without crossing the streams, but you're definitely going to have to do something because if you get it screwed up, it's going to ruin the result. Likewise, you need to clean your glassware between. Now, you also can't forget to add the starch. If you don't add the starch, it'll never turn blue. It'll turn a very strong blue. It's very easy to see. Okay, and then finally, we don't have hot water in the lab. We have to bring it in. I haven't totally figured out how we're going to do this, but we'll find some way to, to get your 
samples up. They need to be up around 40, 30, and then 20, and then something cold. So we'll figure that out later. Okay, so by the end of the lab, you should have the five different mixtures at the same temperature, or use different concentrations and how long it took, took blue. You should also have a separate table with four different temperatures um, and the time it took to turn blue. And finally, the time it took to turn blue in the presence of a catalyst. Now, depending on your instructor, you may get a worksheet uh, depending on when you're doing this in the lab sequence. If you're doing it towards the end of the, the lab quarter, then perhaps we'll, uh, we'll just do a worksheet, have something that you'll have to solve yourself or maybe solve in lab during lab. It, it kind of depends on your instructor there. But um, it should be, you know, except for really the Arrhenius equation, it should be a pretty easy lab. The Arrhenius equation requires a little bit of manipulation, but after that, it's, it's pretty straightforward.